Hello, listeners. This is Chris Gore. And for the last year, a lot of people have asked me, why don't you start a podcast? And I thought to myself, just what I need, another thing to do that doesn't make any money. Uh, but I got to thinking about it and I thought, you know, uh, I, that, that could be kind of fun. Uh, but I wanted, really wanted to have like a premise or an idea behind doing a podcast. So let me just explain what this is. Basically, I'm too lazy to do a podcast. So what I do is I just appear on other people's podcasts. Welcome to the show. My name is Chris Gore, often referred to on the internet as that Chris Gore, and I'm sitting here at I'm sitting here at uh, my house. But uh, I, I guess I like to call this place Gore Walker Ranch because I don't really have any other name for it. Gore Walker Ranch seems to work with me, and I'm sitting here uh, with my show producer Sean Merrick. Uh, why don't you say hi, Sean? Hi, Sean. Uh, good. We're uh, because we're doing this so indie and low budget, we have one microphone between the two of us, so we're we're uh, we're actually sitting very close to each we're other. Very, we're very huddled in this uh, in this uh, Gore Walker Ranch, which sounds like a great dressing. Well, this is the first thing. I mean, I have to ask you. You're, you're the producer of this podcast. Yes. We have no equipment. We we took uh, quite some time to set this up. This I, th I mean, this is the first podcast, and we could have done nine podcasts with the time it it took to figure out how to set up this uh, this microphone and, and get get this all working but but it uh, also it also kind of is indicative of your the whole reason why you're it take it, you're too lazy to do a podcast I'm too lazy to set a up a lot of work right I'm too lazy to set up to record a podcast much less actually do one every week like I, I look I applaud all the people out there for for pod I, I mean I, I am definitely addicted to podcasts. I, uh, I have wireless speakers all throughout my place, not only to listen to uh, DVD commentary while I go to the bathroom. It's awesome. I'm telling you, one of the coolest things in the world, getting up, um, if you've got to go to the bathroom, which I often do, which I, I, I often, and I'll tell you why. It's actually, this segues into something that, uh, that I would like to do. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, many of you know me from G4 TV's Attack of the Show, and on that show, uh, I, you know, I'm on for like uh, maybe five, ten minutes a week. I'm on the show. I get to talk about DVDs. It's a great forum. I get to do and, and, and say whatever I want about these movies. I can't believe what I get away with on that show. It's, I feel very, very lucky. But uh, I don't really get to talk a lot about myself. So one of the things that, that uh, I'm making a promise about is that I will, I prom my promise to you is that I will reveal something shocking and personal about myself every week. And I'm talking about more shocking and worse than you read on Twitter. Um, if you follow my Twitter at that Chris Gore, you know that I'm I'm pretty shocking and revealing. Um, Sean, I'm sure I've 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 uh, made you feel uncomfortable. You know, worse than actually sitting next to me. Yeah, it's 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 a very uh, unique situation to be in. Uh, I've only known you maybe for a couple of weeks, so I'm learning a lot about this. Uh, well, the the, I gotta I gotta say, like as a producer, the thing I like most about you um it, and i'm being dead serious is that you'll work for free yes I'll, so i'll work for negative dollars i actually reached negative dollars in my bank account the other day and i kind of felt that i i lost it like for a minute there but so i know what that's like so considering uh i think you're already in the hole from the gas uh, getting out here but but uh one of the things about me that uh maybe not a lot of people know is um that i i only have one kidney Okay. I only have one kidney, and uh, I, I was born that way. It's extremely rare. Um, and it happened where I was talking to my doctor. And I, would, I, I love going to the doctor because there's nothing. You cannot embarrass me. I will talk about anything. I don't care. I will discuss whatever. It, nothing can embarrass me. I'll just, well, you know, my, I was having a problem with my penis. And I love to do, because doctors, they're not phased. They don't care. They're like, they're like the lawyers of the body. It doesn't matter to them. It's all business, all professional. I remember talking to my doctor and saying, "Look, I, I, I think I pee more than more than other friends of mine. I'm going to the bathroom a lot. I, I go to the bathroom more often than girls." So my doctor said, "Look, here's what you do: keep a spreadsheet. Keep a spreadsheet. How often you pee, uh, and and how many ounces." 
So I kept the spreadsheet for three days of how, how much I peed and the, the exact ounces that I peed in. And um, I was really proud of myself because I, lo I love to do projects like that. It was like I was my own science experiment. So I, I deliver this to my doctor a week later and uh, he looks at the sheet and says, oh my God, oh! freaks out and says, you, you, you pee three times more than the average person. This is, I, I got it. We, we got to check you out. So I actually get an ultrasound and an ultrasound is something that it's mostly done on uh, women when they're pregnant. You know, it's, you can sort of get a view inside the human body uh, uh, via these sound waves, right? So, so uh, the, the technician hooks me up, puts this little jelly on, is sort of looking at my stomach, and he says, total deadpan. He says, um, hey, have you ever been to Mexico? And I said, no. I mean, I, I, I've actually never been to Mexico. Um, and then he said, uh, have you ever been in a car accident? I said, no, I've never been seriously injured in a car accident. He says, yeah, I can't find your other kidney. So... I, I was shocked, and I remember calling my mom and saying, um, hey, mom, uh, just to let you know, it's no big deal, um, but uh, yeah, I only have one kidney. She was so distraught, like she failed me as a mother. So uh, I felt really bad, like, no, mom, it's cool, it's, it's, it's fine. And I, and I asked my doctor, like, hey, is this, how is this going to affect me like um, going forward? Like, I only have one kidney. He says, well, first thing, um, you, you cannot donate a kidney. That's number one. Um, he says, number two, uh, you probably should not go skydiving. If you have an accident, you could puncture, uh, your kidney, you'd, you'd be screwed. Um, the other thing is no contact sports. Hey, I, I'm good on all of those. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good on all three. So I'm fine with my mono kidney. It's, it's actually larger and cigar shaped, but there is nowhere that I go, nowhere that I go that I, I, I where I, I must be acutely aware of exactly where the bathroom is. I have to know where the bathroom is. And the worst thing is, here's the worst thing about me. Here's how you can tell if I have to pee. Do you know how? How? Oh. Look at me. If you look at me, I pretty much have to pee. I, in fact, I always, before I do my uh, little DV Tuesday segment on, on, uh, on Attack of the Show, I, I have to pee before. It's, a, it's one of those things where it's like I don't want to be on camera and have to, have to pee. So it's, it's sort of like, in addition, I have this psychological issue um, on top of the fact that I actually only have the single kidney. Although, if you think about it, um, X-Men First Class, one of my favorite movies this year. I really love that film. And one of the themes of that film is mutant and proud. Technically speaking, I am a mutant. I am a mutant. I have, I have one kidney. This is not, this is not a normal thing. I'm definitely, um, uh, uh, I'm, in, in the eyes of nature, I am some new creature. Now, here's the issue. You're a whole new, you're a whole new genus of yeah, species. I am a new species. Now, here's the thing. Will I use my power for good and join Professor X's Academy or for evil and join the Brotherhood of Mutants? I don't know. I know exactly what my superhero name would be. I would be the Urinator. I would be, my superhero name would be the Urinator. And as soon as the villains show up, I'd say, excuse me, I really have to go pee. I'll be right back. So, so in a way, I'm kind of actually a distraction. And then like the real superheroes like Wolverine and... Cyclops and that they can come in and kick ass. Marvel Girl. I always had a thing for Marvel Girl. I would think that maybe you might be more of a villain because you probably would be spending more time in the bathroom than most and it would be clogging up the general like flow of life and that's how you're 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 well, cycling I mean, I, life by being in the bathroom. Now my like 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 my superhero name the urinary, that doesn't sound good. Maybe the thinker because I'm always on the toilet. Mm. The I was going to say the tinkler. The tinkler. The, no, I said the thinker. The tinkler is good too. But the, th no, the tinkler is my sidekick. The thinker, I think I'm the thinker. I don't know. I just, actually, I, actually, I read, I read this book years ago, uh, Bud, the Brando I knew about Marlon Brando. Uh -huh. One of the interesting facts, I, of course I keep track of all this stuff. One of the interesting facts um, in that, in that book is that Marlon Brando used to pee sitting down. Here's the question. Why are you on this podcast? You're the producer of the show. Why are you sitting here next to me? Because I want to uh, see success. I want to. I want to help uh, get 
get you on awesome shows. Uh, yes, yeah. And have just to see what happens and have you discuss and and learn and uh, and just entertain. This this okay, I got to tell you, you don't even convince me. This is this is this is I'm I'm t- not, but here here here's why. I'm going to tell you why. I there's a lot of podcasts out there that interview big names, celebrities. You know, I, I, I do that in my daily job, but I actually find, for me, I find celebrities, the big actors, the least interesting part of the process in terms of making film or TV. I, I always prefer to talk to writers, directors, but at the same time, I'm the kind of person that uh, I'll, be, I'll go to Osh or a Home Depot or a Lowe's and I'll be going in the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, I will go, I'll, I'll be, uh, you know, checking out the lumber aisle, and I'll be uh, talking to somebody about some project, something I'm trying to make, and, and I love to talk to regular people about regular everyday things, and uh, I just, I don't know, I've always, I'm always fascinated by just other people's lives, not your... Uh, I, I know that we, we live in a celebrity-obsessed culture. I am one of the people that is not celebrity-obsessed, and I'm pretty ignorant of celebrities' personal lives. I have no idea who's dating who or what's... Um, that, that, that stuff just doesn't occur to me. So I just like talking to people who are extremely passionate about what it is that they do, mm-hmm. which for me, I'm excited about the prospect of appearing on uh, all types of different podcasts. Now a lot of people would expect me to be on a movie podcast, right? Right. Oh, you're going you're the movie guy. Um you should be on a movie podcast. Well, uh, yeah, but that's too obvious. Um I want to be on all types of podcasts. I mean, um I mean if you follow me in the social media circles, uh, you know that I just have a variety of interests. I like Sean, you would not have guessed this about me. I like to craft. Yeah. I am into crafting. What, what kind what kind of craft I do all kinds of crafting I I, I modded my uh, car to be uh, like a Batmobile mm-hmm. okay. I I like I like to make all types of things um, where I'd like to this desk that we're sitting at recording this podcast I actually took parts from two other desks desks and I made what I like to call mega desk this is actually mega desk 2.0 and I, I made these parts you can't see it I'll uh, I'll tweet out some pictures. It's it has like these these things that sort of like, like it's like it's like a, a Swiss Army knife where parts and other uh, shelves sort of come out from underneath the desk. I can slide things out and I've got extra space. Um, I, I know I'm 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 definitely I'm like a friend of mine once called me the Martha Stewart of nerds. So I would like to be in a crafting podcast. I am I am in the world of uh, you know there's a, a, a obviously I hang out with a lot of people who are movie geeks, but I happen to also love sports. Yes. I love sports. I football my favorite sport. Why? It's the gayest of all the sports. Why why do you think that? If you if because if you listen to announcers who announce football, it sound if you take away the word football, they may as well be announcing gay porn. I mean, it's like he got full penetration right up the middle. There's about 10 guys in there. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, I mean, it's just it's the most if you just listen they're wearing tights they're they're just they're I mean they're they're piled on each other. It is it is a it is a male orgy in those giant piles grabbing for balls. It's men playing with their balls. However, I love watching a great sporting event because it's like watching a documentary unfold live. You don't know how it's going to turn out. Yeah, it's real life. There's yeah, it's, there's drama. So, my intention with this podcast is I will have guests here at Gore Walker Ranch that are just regular people. I think I think you're a regular person. You're like a regular dude. Yes, yes, I am. I you're regular. Honest. Yes. You're just regular. Yes. I, normal dude. Normal dude. There's not anything weird about you. Nope. I live I live in the valley. You, 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 there's, do. there's so many weird things about me. You are going to... I, I'm concerned for you being involved in this whole venture. We'll see how this works out. Yeah. Um, so I just uh, so this podcast will be an opportunity for me to explore all my interests beyond films um, and talk to other people about their passions. And speaking of that, um, first podcast that I will present to you on Pod Crash, clips from Proudly Resents. 
Um, you can check out uh, their website at proudlyresents.com. Uh, I was invited to appear on the podcast by Adam Spiegelman, who's a comedian, a producer. Um, uh, he's a TV producer, and he started this podcast. And the, the premise behind the podcast is that you take a film that's a guilty pleasure, right? Film that you know is just bad, and you you discuss that movie on the podcast. Well, I sat down to talk to him, and I we had intended to speak about Logan's Run which at some point, uh, I think I don't think that podcast has aired yet, but uh, we did end up talking about Logan's Run later in the podcast. But I sat down and I just started, like I began this podcast, I started ranting. Mm-hmm. I just started going off on one of my rants, and uh, Adam just thought that was entertaining enough that he would just do a podcast of me uh, ranting. And I, I actually, I haven't, I mean, I, I said these things on this podcast, but I haven't actually heard it. Because I don't like to listen to myself. The sound of my own voice is not, um, it's sort of irritating. I think like the sound of um, a lot of people when they listen to the sound of their own voice. I don't want to hear it. It's really really difficult to get over it, especially when you think you sound a certain way and then you don't. Yes. No, I think I I don't want to. Yeah. Why did I, first of all, why did I even start this podcast then? I don't want to listen to me. This is awful. This is the worst, the first podcast. And I don't even want to listen. I'm too lazy to even listen to myself. But, uh. I, I, I went to downtown L.A., met with Adam Spiegelman for Proudly Resents, proudlyresents.com. Here are highlights from that podcast. You can listen to the full podcast by going to proudlyresents.com. Uh, thank you to Adam for tolerating me. Hi, this is Adam. Adam Spiegelman from uh, Proudly Resents, the cult movie podcast. We have funny comedians talk about their favorite cult films and the people who made them. It's like a comedy version of the Flop House. Anyway, it's not important. We have a great show. Uh, Chris Gore is on, and uh, I've been a huge fan of that guy since the 80s when he started a zine. He literally Xeroxed copies of his own magazine called Film Threat, and then he and the magazine both became huge parts of the indie movie world. I had him come on to do the show, and he talked. We we're going to talk about a movie, Logan's Run. But from the moment he walked into the studio to the moment we walked to our cars, he kept talking. And luckily, I had um, the microphone on for most of it. So this episode is really just an interview with him, which is really funny and fascinating. We talk about the beginnings of how he started in, in the business in his own unusual way and his insane theories on um, lots of crazy things. I really enjoyed it. We also have another episode where he's gonna, we'll talk about Logan's run and his theory on the Planet of the Apes movies. So, all right, so we're going to do the actual show because I'm enjoying talking. To you. Yeah, let's just talk then. This is probably <laughs> resents from Chris Gore. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, my girlfriend listens to the show, so we can't. She listens to the show, so yeah. don't talk about your girlfriend. Talk about yeah. It's smart. Well, tell me about your girl. Uh, oh, and don't hit the table. That's oh, okay, the only don't hit the table. Could have sounded like that. Oh, okay. I know. I, I love to it's pound hard. the table. I love to speak to my girlfriend. I love to pound things. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, but my girlfriend, uh, I mean, she's amazing because she's. Um, I'm, I'm kind. I, I, I like to do. I like. Let's just say that this. My, my taste when it comes to food is very pedestrian. Uh, but when it comes to sex, I have a very rich, wide variety of interests when it comes to sex. And I need a, need a, a woman who uh, feels willing the same way. Yeah, willing you, participant. You can't yeah. date an Applebee's is what yeah, you're exactly. saying. You yeah. need to go worldwide. Precisely. And also, I, I hate to exercise. I, I, think, I think people, when I see them jogging on the street, I think they're idiots. I think what they want to do is they want to advertise the fact that, look at me, I'm exercising. Or anyone that would give money to go somewhere – so they could stink with a bunch of other people lifting and weights. Listen to techno. Yeah, yeah, they're they're idiots. I I I, I just think it's ridiculous to publicly exercise. I think is moronic. So I just I just like to have regular sex. So you're um, saying sex is your exercise, that, half hour a day. Yes. You have a trainer. When I have a you... girlfriend, my abs are in such good shape, <laughs> and I, I I keep I keep my weight down because right. I am I. When you're Love single, you can just see it's it, you go to you go to pot. Yeah, you exactly. We, exactly. When I'm single, I'm drinking way too much beer. <laughs> right, and, right. And, well, that's what, true too. You have no excuse. You're just like you're in the worst condition. You think you ever think when you're sing, when you're dating someone, you're like, God damn, if I was single, 
I would be home right now, watching TV, drinking beer. Wouldn't that be great? And then when you're singing, like, this is fucking retarded. <laughs> right, 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 right. This is what you do because you have to do it. Right. This but, is a default. Yeah, but, but, but I, I do – the regular girlfriend just keeps me in shape, physical right. shape. And so, so I'm in good shape right now. i got to say. You look good. You look like yeah. your relationship is going well. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it's going well. <laughs> uh, but every once in a while, I'll blow it up, you know. When, uh, when you, you can tell those, you have problems. Um, yeah, my problems around. in the relationship. That's when I get fat. You're right. So you have to, you, and it's kind of like a sci-fi film. You're like, honey, we have to have sex for for my body. This shirt won't fit. Yeah. I spent a hundred bucks on this shirt. It's not going to fit unless you fuck me right now. Yeah. It's yeah, like it's ridiculous. like Speed. It's like the movie Speed, but <laughs> right. with sex. I have to keep I have to keep boning her consistently, or, <laughs> or I'm going to get fat and explode. I'm going to explode into a fat guy. Is that why you have a picture of Dennis Hopper in your bedroom above the bed? How did you know? That, that? is so that, weird. That is exactly I didn't you never do. know why. Yeah. 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 And uh, it's looking it's down it at me. It, it keeps you focused. It keeps you focused. Yeah. Those piercing <laughs> eyes are like, damn. Uh, what is the nationality of your girlfriend? I don't know why that. Uh, I feel like I, I'm going to say before you tell me I'm going to say it's, it's not it's 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 not a white chick. I yes. Think. Well, no, partially. But I see the thing is this like uh, uh, I mean I'll tell you. Oh yeah, but, but at home guess the, what you think it is. Yeah, and you're yeah. a racist for thinking what you think. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but what's weird is is that like uh, people will ask me like uh, when I'm single like well, what's your type what's what's the girl that you like it's like I don't know like my girlfriend in college was black you know um, uh, I have a girlfriend that was like. Jewish girlfriend that was like half Irish, half Japanese. Like they're just like the only thing that all these girls have in common. There's only one consistent thing I have discovered. This is like me discovering about myself. They all wear glasses. Every single girl, like to me, glasses are that's like, your type. That's like fuck me pumps. I mean, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's like I like smart chicks. I right. like a chick that you know. I don't just get into you know her, her. It's not about her looks. To me, it's like really about like her like mind. Although it is about her looks. No, it's about her looks. Come on, none of these women are ugly. Yeah, yeah. but my yeah, but uh, my, my girlfriend is she's half Chinese, half uh, uh, half Jewish, half Jewish, half, half Chinese. Jewish. You, that's a combo you rarely see. Does oh, does her dad own that Chinese Jewish restaurant? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no. It's called uh, Sosumi. Listen, oh, oh, <laughs> look on. at you. Look at me. Uh, pull that out. Eighth grade. It's great. Yeah. Oh, I've been waiting twenty five years to tell uh, that joke. Yeah. That's well, she does. The thing I knew is, Asian. By the way, anyone else disagreeing with me? I knew Asian. There's got to be an Asian in there. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. She. Um, well, the funny thing is, she's the one that always makes the Asian jokes. You know, she's like, me Chinese, me play joke. Oh, really? Complete that sentence. Right. Exactly. But that's she's the great. Jewish side of her being a dick. Yeah, exactly. The Jewish side of her hates her. <laughs> one thing I'll say, uh, if I may interrupt the podcast for a second, I, I get oddly personal with some people. I mean, there's stuff that I reveal about myself, and I don't, I, I don't really realize I'm doing it. I'm just sort of just, I'm just like right out there. I don't care what people think of me that's sort of my um that's just something about me since uh, since i was a since i've been a kid i don't know there's just been a thing i just don't care i i've been made fun of i think i i i, I think i was called fag 10 million times in high school never sucked a cock i just don't i don't give a shit i don't care it doesn't matter so i will just reveal the most bizarre personal stuff and i'm actually uh, listening to that now it's kind of embarrassing uh, should we go on? Uh, just, keep, just keep going. Yeah. So you've not traveled. Where did you go to school? I went to Wayne State University in Detroit and promptly dropped out a couple of years. I'm serious. I, I dropped out. Um, I was taking film and English, dropped out, moved to L.A., and then this is this is the, uh, years later. I wrote a book called The Ultimate Film Festival Survival Guide, which is now in its fourth edition, available uh, from Random House. Um, a- anyways, uh, what's what's ironic is now that book is required reading in film school at like USC, UCLA for their for their independent film studies, right. AFI, NYU, like like it's it's, it's you couldn't get into those schools. It was, I could not get into those schools. And that was actually a tr- true story. I was 19 years old, came out, I really wanted to go to USC because that's where George Lucas and all these big people went. And I, and I thought, uh, these filmmakers I admired, I thought, I want to go to USC. I went there. The tuition was just insane then. I sadly went to the bookstore the, and I just bought as many books as I possibly could for the film program and wrote down the names and authors of every book. And I just read all of them. I, oh, read, really? I read every book. I thought, if I can't afford uh, the education, um, then I will, I, I, I'll just consume the same books as, these, as the guys going to the school. What you, what you don't really realize is that the education part is sort of the least important part of college. What is the most important part? 
connections. Yeah. It's really about making those connections that last a long time. So if you're around a bunch of affluent, connected people, Uh, kids or whose families are connected, you should get to know them when they're younger in college so that, that you can take advantage of those relationships later. It's like a VIG. It's like a $50,000 VIG or something. Yeah. It's, an introduction. Cause it's you're right. Like if you're going to NYU, club. right. It's a country club. If you can afford NYU. Then you're kind of like me. And then yeah. you get in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I, so just me, I've always been sort of the punk rock DIY, uh, you know, like, Oh, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to start a magazine. I'm just going to make a film. I'm just going to write a book. But what's equally as important as skill and, um, is just those relationships. You realize later, business-wise, how important that is. Just as someone who has consistently shot uh, themselves in the foot in terms of career, I'm just <laughs> you like... You have, you think. Oh, yeah. There are lots of opportunities. Oh, God, yeah. Opportunities and like, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, what is it? You know, so, we were talking before, people come to you with stuff now at this point. Now, you made your um, own yeah. way, which is important, I think, with it, anything. Well, definitely, I think you have an appreciation when, you know, you, you know, working in the business and actually, you know, getting paid for things that you do is great. What came first for you, the, the book or the magazine film threat? Well, I, st- I started film threat when I was like, uh, God, I was like 19, 18, 19 years old and started that like right out of high school and, and, uh. So how does that work? I and mean, there's no internet at the time. That there's these, these... This is the 80s. Yeah, right. there was nothing. I mean, it was just like it was a fanzine. And I, I, it, was, it was literally something I took to Kinko's and had Xeroxed. How so, many copies did you start out with? The first issue was, the first issue was like 500 copies. And uh-huh. uh, it was, uh, uh, I mean, it was just something I sort of passed out for free in film class. So the first nine issues of film that were just these Xerox sort of like, you know, F you to Hollywood and all these like just horrible things. I look back and I really regret like, oh man, I... Well, I shouldn't have, well, I shouldn't have done stuff like that. That's that's horrible. The older me is so offended by the younger me. <laughs> what is younger the, you? Look at you. Let's channel the younger Chris Gore. Let's let's hold our hands out. What was some of the things that the young? Um, we held an essay contest that because um, uh, Sylvester Stallone was coming out with just all these like uh, violent movies at the time, which I think the Rambo were, Three, the Rambo, Rambo Three, and stuff like that. Yeah. We had a contest in it that um, write an essay that if you had AIDS, why you would want to fuck <laughs> Sylvester Stallone in the ass. Um, and I look back on that and I regret You're maybe regretting. having run that contest. Who was uh, the winner of the contest? Uh, I, I don't I don't even remember. Sylvia but Plath. but we would do we would do like a lot of we would just do a lot of like con, you know parody movie posters and contests and just things really just to fuck with people and it was just sort of it's very anti-establishment and then sort of the indie film scene and film festivals were coming up and film threat kind of evolved into that magazine. How, did, actually, how did it blow up? I got uh, I got an investor at the time to just put some money into the printing so we could just you know distribute it in comic book and alternative uh, bookstores. You know, ones that mostly are the only ones that exist anymore because all the chains are dying. Um, and then and then I moved to L.A. and I got a job writing for Hustler magazine. I wrote uh, a section called Bits and Pieces. This is like 1989. What was that about? It was made to appeal to the Larry Flint sense of humor, which I described as toilet poo-poo homo butt. <laughs> Anything in those arenas. So he had seen some things I had done in Film Threat and thought, like the writing. And uh, I got hired as an associate editor on Hustler and I would just write comedy bits. It would be like some of them were just like the revenge of Anne Frank. And it was a, f- a fake movie poster with Anne Frank as a zombie Anne Frank risen from the dead to kill Nazi skinheads. I'll buy I, it. Because I hate Nazi skinheads. Like growing up in Detroit, there Nazi skinheads was like a certain part of Detroit had a lot of them. And I fucking hated those guys. Uh-huh. Uh, white supremacist assholes. Anyway, so it was just sort of like an outlet to like, okay, I can be funny. And then a little, little social political commentary here and there. So, so I did that. And I just said to Larry, I said, hey, you know, you do this alternative adult magazine why don't you do an alternative movie magazine and was able to trick them into buying film threat was that the intention when you went there like I hope to I trick can... him yes absolutely seriously well, it was like basically to move to la because I, I i'd done this sort of like i'm gonna either move to la or new york and i thought new york smells like pee and is expensive i'll move to la it's cheaper um, and people are dumber, and I really like that. I love the fact that like people in L.A. are stupider, yeah. and um, that just sort of like gives me just the advantage I need. I'm not saying I'm smart. I'm saying I'm just smarter than dumb people. 
Right, just a, a good little advantage. bit, just a you little bit. An advantage. Yeah, so so moved to LA in '89, and 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 uh, that was my first like straight job was doing the the hustler thing, and and um, Larry liked actually Larry liked the stuff that I did so much he actually compiled an entire issue just dedicated to all the comedy bits I did. Oh wow! Which apparently was not particularly. Well, it didn't sell very well. You mean the guys who were buying a magazine to look at tits and ass were not happy to see uh, Anne Frank All as a zombie? Dumb humor. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, I, you know, I don't know. I was, you know, I, I, was, I was kind of proud of, of some of those bits, you know, like, uh, I, I mean, it was, it was a good outlet for, because it's the one thing I just can't stop is I can't stop doing stuff that, um, it's just the, the, the humorous stuff just pops into my head. I mean, I was the kid that, like, um, I, I did really well in school, but I was always in the office for being disruptive. Because I would fuck with the teacher, I would play jokes, I would question dumb things they would say, I would say I would say stuff and 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 get everybody laughing, and uh, I I don't know there was just like something in me that was just sort of burning desire to fuck with whatever the establishment was. It's hard though with a magazine Consumer. like Hustler that has also nudity. I think because all you care about you, you want to look at the nudity. I remember there was a film magazine, maybe you know of it. I don't know. I used to get it randomly because you know a premiere and all those other stuff. Every other page was an ad for porn. So, like, any film commentary in the middle was lost because you're just like, oh, look, look at this page. You know, mm, and you couldn't. You sure it was adult video news? I think that. <laughs> it uh, might have been it. AVN magazine. Is no, it was, it was before that. And there was another one in down south. They had a humor magazine and when I was working in Florida, MTV Spring Break, not to show off. But it was a humor magazine, and it, all the ads were for strip clubs. And nice. It, yeah. So again, you just like it overpowers the humor, or you can't have like kids listen to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or some podcasts that have like Adam and Eve as advertisers. Right. You, like you've already you've already changed the rating on your. But show. I know I'm going to jerk off at some point. Who's okay. Gonna, so so no I matter appreciate. What. Yeah. I I appreciate the uh, help. The, the help exactly. <laughs> Steer me in the right direction, please. Will you ever get tricked? You know, they don't do as much anymore. But you get an email, and it's like. Hey, it's me, Ted. And you're like, I think I know a Ted. And you open it up and you press the link and it's porn. Right. You don't need to trick me into looking at porn. Yeah, That's exactly. My thing. Stop tricking us. Just tell us, hey, you like porn. <laughs> I actually like porn. I, yes, yeah. I do. I have a uh, Hotmail account. I must like uh, porn. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's nothing better than that like shared experience of you can find a girl who also likes porn. Right. That is awesome. But a you can't go too far. Because the girl's like, oh, I like porn. They're like, oh, great. And then they go, oh, that's, you're gross. I like porn, uh, but you're too. I don't know. I, 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 I kind of, I, my whole challenge is to go too far. Oh, my challenge is to go to my challenge is to be with the girl who go. I've never done that, and then I've never done that. That's the one thing I will not do. My challenge is to now <laughs> do that thing that you say you won't do. I think that's. Yes, I yes. think that instantly in your mind, you're like, oh, we have to do that. It's, yes, yeah, it's, that's it's like a quest. Yeah, it's, it's like a quest, a quest for me. That's, that's, it becomes the quest. But no, you can find that. I feel like there's like the holy triumvirate of a girl that can like porn, Star Wars, or just anything geeky. I don't care. Right. Just the Star Wars represents geeky stuff. So porn, Star Wars, and sports. If you can find that in a chick, the holy <laughs> triumvirate. That's all you're looking that's, for. That's, yeah. I've only been able to find two of the three. Uh-huh. You can find two of the three, but never three. That's pretty you. Cool. And your girlfriend now? Uh, two. Which I got one? the two. She, she, she likes porn, and she's the total geek. She's awesome when it comes oh, to Oh, that's great. Not so much into the sports, but... Uh, All right, so listen, uh, Sunday you But she, you she likes spectacle. So it's like, you know, if we go see a, a baseball game, we can drink beer. We can she's drink beer while being entertained. Exactly. It's yeah. like, and you can't, uh, you, you can't, not every theater, you can drink beer at the movies, although. And there's more and more now. More and more now. I think that is, I think literally, the, this is, I, I'm going to announce to the Hollywood industry, executives, Hollywood, everyone listening to this. Hold on, guys. Put down your cell phones. Put down your cell phones. Yeah, yeah. I want you to pay attention for the next 15 seconds. Forget 3D. Just serve beer at the movies. That's it. Just yeah, you can call it Brewies. You just <laughs> you just all, gave them Brewies. I just yeah, Brewies. You, you can it take away. it. The, the, the whole thing, it just I mean, this is it's the simplest thing. It's become actually truthfully. There's a theater chain in in Texas that a lot of people know about, the Alamo Draft House, probably my favorite movie theater in America, along with the ArcLight Cinemas here in here in L.A., which is also expanding. You just have to serve alcohol. It's what people want. It's like they don't want 3D. They're not willing to pay more money for. But you can charge me six dollars for a Bud Light. 
It's yeah, oh, fine. Or even the adult, uh, the Arclight, they have adult cinema. They, they have one. It's the Black Box Theater. It's upstairs. It's 21 and over. It's very, you know, they have a bar. They got to give you a little plastic cup. It's, it's, it's fine, but, but the way they do it right is in, at the Alamo Draft House where they actually have, like, this um, my, little table in front of you and you can order everything from, like, oh, they have that cheeseburgers. Too. Yeah, like, I mean, there's more and more theaters are doing it. The problem is they're charging too much. It's just like, look, charge me what you would normally charge for a movie. In fact, better yet, drop the price of a movie. And then, you're going to get the and, beer and, money. And then you get the beer is where that's where you make the money on the refreshments, lower the oh, prices. Oh, that's actually a great idea. Because even a second-run movie, if you charge me four bucks for a second-run movie, I'll go and drink and have a good time. Yeah, no, I'm not – look, just I, – look, I'm going to – obviously in our conversation, I'm talking about a lot of different things. I am not uh, the, uh, paid – to endorse this stuff. These are things that I just normally do that I want to tell other people about. And i got to clue you in the Vineland Drive-In Theater, the Pacific Vineland Drive-In. Just look up Vineland Drive-In Theater. How, is that far, how far is it's, that from it's, 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 it's uh, where the 210 and 605 meet, like oh, City of I'm Industry. It's like, oh, uh, City of Industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Experiment it's, it's, Rhino. Yeah, it, it, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all those like horrible strip clubs, like the Kit Kat Club. Yeah, those, like, where awful anything ones. goes. Yeah, yeah, where, where every girl repeats the exact same rap. It's like, you said exactly what the other girl said. What is that? Oh, it's uh, so good. It's, what do you do? Yeah, Can I, just, just I got so busted at a strip club once in Vegas. It was in the afternoon. We were, uh, my buddy and I we drove in. We're going to go. We, I think it was called Strip Tease. And the guy, first thing he just apologizes and says, Listen, we had a huge party last night. All the girls were there late at night. There's nobody here around. So some girl, she's dancing with me and she goes, What do you do? And I start talking with Joe. And she starts acting interested. And I was like, Oh, maybe I'm a hot shot. She goes, Tell me more about it. Next song. I'm like, you, I'm busted. <laughs> She got my ego to fucking talk about myself. You know, the I, dancing I didn't care as much I, I, about than talking about my own business. I'm not a fan of strip clubs. The only strip club I really go to is uh, the only strip club I go to is uh, Jumbo's. Jumbo's, Cl- Jumbo's Clown Room. It's like a great dive bar. You can actually talk to the girls. And I don't like, I've dated a couple of girls from there. But I just say that. Were they um, girls? Oh, there they were girls. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they were definitely girls. Um, but the thing is, my whole rap is I don't. Want to pay like like I, I know that you're thinking about your laundry or your kid <laughs> or paying for college I think or your boyfriend me. or getting money for drugs. I know that your your brain is elsewhere. You don't care about me. So my whole rap is that I just don't care. So what ends up happening? And I don't. I genuinely don't. Like I know your mind is elsewhere and you only care about the money. I end up getting strippers' phone numbers. This is what happens. I get their phone numbers, or suddenly I'm Facebook friends with the girl that I saw at this strip club. So why is that? Because I. I don't give a shit. And as look, here, here's another pro tip. Um, the don't give a shit attitude is like a cologne that attracts a vagina. <laughs> this has worked with me, worked for me my entire life. So just don't give a shit. And all races, by the way, you've dated all, all races. All it races. works everywhere. It works. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but back to the Vineland drive in um, eight fifty to get in. Kids are free. You can you go into the, the the sound comes through your your car speakers you know just through low uh, frequency radio. There's four screens. They show first run movies. You can see three movies in a night. It's awesome. I'll bring, I mean I, and I'm hardcore. When I go there, I'll like I bring these sports chairs that have like the cup holder you know, and I'll bring a cooler filled with beer. You can sit outside your car. Sit outside. It's like tailgating with movies. People. I mean you can. You can smell. People are smoking herbs. What? They're smoking herbs. I'm not, a, I'm not a pot smoker, but I support. I like the smell of it. Like, I like the smell of gasoline. You like the smell of cocaine. That I was a problem gas- for years. Exactly. <laughs> gasoline, pot. I love these smells. I just right. don't partake. Um, but um, I, it, it's awesome. So you just bring your own refreshments. I'll even here, – here's how hardcore I am. I bring my own popcorn wrapped in aluminum foil that I stick next to the engine block once I arrive in order to heat said popcorn. <laughs> Folks, you can you can cook a baked potato next to an engine block. Uh, drive, so is that what you do at the drive drive-in? on the drive on the freeway for about uh, 30, 40 minutes uh, with a baked potato. You'll have baked potatoes at the drive-in. My cousin used to make uh, tuna melt. He'd leave it in his car when he would work on the construction site. He'd leave it on the dashboard, and it would melt. And uh, genius until his wife's like, "You're a fucking idiot. That will kill you." But he did it for about four months. Whoa, whoa, yeah. <laughs> well, also, your car is going to smell like fucking tuna meat. <laughs> Jesus, oh my God. That's another thing you didn't think about. Yeah, yeah. but that's a great excuse if you want to cheat on someone. Oh, just no. the tuna melt excuse. <laughs> You know, it's the whole thing of like, it's like, it's like, it's that, that old thing of like going to a strip club and then making sure you get gasoline on the way home so that you get it on you. Right. I, uh, I don't know why I had, it sounds like such a bullshit excuse. I'm going to cut this. Uh, I had glitter on me and my girlfriend's like, were you at a strip club? I was like, 
What the fuck? What? Did I, oh, you were at a strip club. No, I wasn't. It was, what was it? I think it was. Uh, I don't know. It, you, it might have been my my little cousins, you know, picking up their books or something. I don't know. Exactly. Listen, working with orphans, I work with a lot of orphans. Sure, yeah, yeah. Feeding the homeless, maybe some of the homeless people had, you know, when I was helping Why children, not? Why you not? know, I was reading, I was reading to poor children. But this driving, on the this driving is packed. Unlike unlike the weekends, you better get there an hour before. You're not going to get in. That's like this, you're not going to make the first movie. Uh, and then you can see. So three. you can wait for the next film. Uh, yeah. So what you do, you know, it's, it's like they show trailers in between. There's like a little, you know, break in between each movie. I saw like four movies in one night because I was switching screens. Oh wow! It's like, eh, let's just watch the end of Cowboys and Aliens. We'll go see Captain America, then Horrible Bosses, and then we'll flip over here. It's like, uh, you know, just it, 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 it's it's great. I, I, I love the. I, I don't I don't know why drive-ins aren't more popular. I think I think that um, the movie studios are just thinking they're looking for a way to charge more, but they're not giving the consumer any any anything more. Well, like the 3D, the people just caught on as bullshit. Uh, yeah, exactly. Look, look, there are good 3D movies out there. There have probably been three. What would you say? Um, I'd say Avatar was never was, heard of it. Yeah, exactly. Avatar, and then uh, I mean, there, there are a couple other. When they're shot native 3D, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's really good. Like the, the that film Priest, the vampire movie, and w- when they shoot them native 3D, they look good. But the thing is. Is this a, you know they have to give you the choice of 2D because there are a lot of people that don't like 3D. And, is and that why it, you think they do it, or I thought they just wanted more theaters? And also, 3D, 3D. I mean, like, look, it has always gone in phases. There's always been like Friday the Thirteenth 3D. I mean, uh, Robert Rodriguez tried it, a, you know, years ago with one of the Spy Kids movies. This is like almost ten years ago. Right. One of the Spy Kids movies was in 3D, and he personally paid for the glasses. Um, wow. to, just to, to to get that in theaters in 3D, um, it's just it's it's something that Hollywood cyclically always tries to to fix. It's like no, you've got to give a better experience. You've got to make it. I don't know. You got to make it fun. And I also think that like with digital screens, they could be doing more. They could be doing like. Um, Here's an example. I, I, I wrote an article about this once about, like, why don't they take, like, the season finale of, like, a big show like Lost and just show it for one weekend in a theater? So it's like you're, you're not only are you seeing it in theater, theaters before everyone else can see it, which, of course, there will be spoilers on the Internet, but who cares? Go to the theater. Yeah. You're, you're sharing that experience of being a fan of that particular show with all these other people who are fans. You know where that comes in? Have you seen the Jackass movies? Like, when yeah. you see them oh. in the theater, it's amazing. People you, it's are getting up. They're running around the aisles. Oh. They're screaming. They're yelling. It's the only movie I've really well, there's a lot of, that in. Yeah, there's you know? a lot of movies that, like, you, I like to go. I hate sitting in a critic screening with like 25 people in a room and they're all sort of their arms folded. And, no, I want to see a movie on opening night, midnight show or opening. There's sort of a chaos out there before and just see that. I, I think you could take some popular shows and as a test, put it on a limited number of screens in theaters and then you, sh- you actually show it on television a week later. Yeah. But you have the advantage of the shared experience of, you know, I, I mean, I would, you know, there were so many lost parties. Why not? Open it on screens. You could digitally. I mean, not the, the finale finale. I think that was kind of a disappointment to people. But right. the, every season finale was so big. Well, so season, so much. season finales of TV shows, you know, they could get – I mean, that could be a thing where, where it's, it's, it, it sort of expands. With movie theaters have to think that – because I think the movies I, – I, I tweeted this once. I said the movies are like a channel, a TV channel I used to like. Uh-huh. Because in general, the movies have become so tiresome. Everything is a reboot or a sequel or a remake or something based on an existing property. You know, I mean, it's 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 um, it's it's just when you go when you there's there's almost a a movie language that people are so hip to. They know everything that's going to happen. It's there are no surprises. No, no. Yeah, everything everything is predictable when it comes to something that is a movie. Like, what is the show now? Like, like Lost. I would. I was thinking about what we were talking. Maybe Walking Dead. Is yeah, Walking one? Dead. If they took the Walking Dead season finale, the two hour season finale, and and put it on you know one thousand screens across the U S. and did some big event. Right, have um, people come out to them and oh my God. whatever it, it would costume be, party contests, whatever. Well, yeah, put the last the last episode is in theaters, and one week later, it actually screens airs on television for free. Not to, we're not going to screw the TV audience or people that are not regular moviegoers. Right. What we're doing is bringing it's it's about bringing the fandom for a particular show together and screening that 
on I see I should be I should be one of these executives. But here's the, pro, the But only I'm just a fan. Get, I'm just a fan that like thinks the, uh, uh, about this stuff. Is that uh the you know the issue that well the cable operators would be pissed off because they would get less viewers or the network affiliates would be pissed it, off. I think I think they would get more. I think they would get more viewers because people would want to see it. They'd want to see, see it again. It again. And you see it in that you're missing the theater. Now you really want to see it. When there's a movie that's an event movie that I want to see, I always see it twice. I'll see it like with the chaos and blah, and I'm been I've had some beer and uh, and. And then I'll see it later where I can actually watch the movie. There's the experience, and then there's, like, enjoying the film. And, uh, more like, did you do experience. that with Captain America? Uh, no, I just saw it at the drive-in. <laughs> what do you think of that? I, I, thought it was, I thought it was fun. I mean, I didn't think it was... I didn't it wasn't think it was a movie. Bad. I didn't. Feel, I felt like it was just like a, a I thought it was tra- a, it episode. Was, it was like a trailer. It, yeah. was, it was like a, a really extended trailer. I felt like it, like... Basically, what it was was it was like a prequel to The Avengers. Yeah. That's all it was, was it like... really was, including a trailer at the end of the movie. And I don't know why they think they have to chronologically tell these stories. I think Marvel would be better off. Like, why don't they just make the Avengers and Captain America's just there? You can do a prequel later and tell his story, which oh, I think would be, be more meaningful. And you can go... I, 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 I don't know. I just think that there's a, a better... They do that in comic books all the time. You know, uh-huh. like, Let's tell the backstory. Maybe let's, there's a character left over. I don't know. And speaking of that, I mean, X-Men First Class, I think one of the best movies of the summer now that all the summer movies have... Oh, really? I never yeah, saw it. Yeah, the X-Men First Class is, is great. I mean, that's an example of a prequel that really uh, just totally solidified. You understand the motivations of those characters and why they are the way they are now. Uh-huh. You know so. what I wanted to talk to you about is Fantastic Four. Yes, exactly. Now, that was a... Well, I don't know if you want to tell the background of that. Well, I mean, like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Fantastic Four. I was actually on the set of the Roger Corman... Film so, where they so, made it. So, they, Roger, you want to tell about the background of that film? Well, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the company. It was, uh, uh, God, I forget the name of the company. It was a German company that owned the rights to Fantastic Four, and they had to have a Fantastic Four movie in production before midnight, December thirty first of this particular year. So they were filming like in December. It was like nine, early nineties, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I was buddies with the guys who did uh, the makeup effects for the film. That's and generous, I, I, I'd, I'd met them. I'd met them on the set of uh, the remake of *Night of the Living Dead*. It was a zombie in *Night of the Living Dead*. Uh-huh. Um, the remake directed by Tom Savini, and, and um, these guys just invited me. Hey, come out and check out the set of the Fantastic Four. And I realized as, as I'm looking at this, going, like, "This is so sad." This is, because it, because the suits were so cheap, oh, the they were effects awful. were so cheap. They had no money. I mean, they basically spent six hundred grand on this movie. Wow! So that they could hold on to the rights. It was basically six hundred grand to hold on to the rights. They hired Roger Corman to produce it because he makes low budget. He films. He makes low budget films. They said, "Here, here's the money. Just make it and don't release it." My, my understanding is the print was burned. And then, of course, they they ended up developing and making the Fantastic Four movie um, that. The, the two films that were made, which I think that they captured the characters right, with the exception of Jessica Alba. I thought the cast was good, and they got, like, you know, Chickless was great as he Ben Grimm. But it was also anemic in terms of the budget, and I thought just the story was lame and rushed. The, the stories, both stories, even with Silver yeah, Surfer, like, I thought what? was lame. But this, Galactus is a cloud, and I think I heard that had something to do with the rights to the Galactus character being used in other other. Um, that's stories. when they get greedy and crazy, and they eat themselves up. And we need this for another property it, it, somewhere exactly. else. That they may gonna, never happen because they were going to make us a, a Silver Surfer movie or something. I, I don't know. In any case, uh, those movies really suffered uh, just from anemic budget and just like to me, just stories. That no, I think the compelling. stories. I mean, have you seen the the Roger Corman? Fantastic yes. Story. Oh, yes. I have a bootleg copy. I had a bootleg copy. Oh, I put it on the cover of Film Threat. I mean, we had the actors do an autograph signing at Comic Con back in like '92 when it came out. Did he? But it didn't really come out. Like who was? Re- it who never released came it? out. It never came out. But you can find it bootleg. You, you can, can definitely find it. You can it, definitely yeah. find it bootleg. But how did? What did they sign at Comic Con? They signed the cover of Film Threat magazine. Oh, okay. We so were like, yeah. we had like, I mean, I did like this whole like 15 page story where um, it was just everything about the characters and whatnot. I mean, I mean, look, Film Threat was always an, an, uh, an expression of my personal obsessions like these are my interests in movies which ran the gamut from geeky to indie right um which is really not a lot of it's weird because like i'm a a sports fan who also is like a huge movie geek and and a comic book geek so it's like i have a lot of friends that are either one or the other no but it's the same thing kind of i don't know if you saw the fan uh with pat oswald oh i love that movie when he'd sit there and like rehearse what he's gonna say on the radio oh so perfect because it's so much like new york radio oh i love it i had a roommate at i went to i don't want to drop names but i went to suny purchase state university new york Mm -hmm. and uh one of my roommates was this guy bull from brooklyn and he was this huge bald guy and he was just like he would rehearse all his stuff and he'd call in and be like hey we got bull from brooklyn on line two and he would rehearse he'd be like like a "Uh, character yeah and he would be nervous shaking his piece of paper hey i think those motherfuckers from cleveland need to yeah but those guys are real but he was saying that pat oswald is not a sports fan that he would use his comic book geekdom 
to translate to sports. Yeah, no, and he's it, definitely not a sports fan. You could tell not in that a movie. sports fan at all. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Well, I uh, just having having uh, you know seen the film and then watched all the extras on the on the DVD. And Patton's talked about that. He's not. He's not a. Well, let's talk about fan. the Fantastic Four. I, it's just yeah. such a great story. Like uh, I, I felt like the Roger Corman low budget, no one should see movie had a better plot than both the high budget. Michael Chiklis movies because it, it actually did it had a plot. It, it actually, had a yeah. bad guy with just some weird, some woman in a witch costume or something. Well, it was it was Doctor Doom, and they they sort of had this backstory that they were rivals in college, which is which is true. And they didn't deal with any of that. I think I think um, Doctor Doom was definitely uh, miscast in in the the Fantastic Four. Was well, that because he's such a great? Uh, no, no, I'm talking. Talk, uh, well, he's great in Nip Tuck. I, it's, the, the, the actor's name escapes me. Right, right. Uh, but but not um, Brendan Walsh, the other guy. Yeah, exactly. But um, uh, it, it just those, those films just felt like they're. You know, um, too too many cooks. Too the high-budget ones. Too many cooks, the high-budget ones, yeah. yeah. The low-budget one was like, I just felt bad when they were making it because I felt like they're really just crapping this out. They really are. Because they, the, yeah. Can we talk about some of this, the effects? Uh, Mr. Fantastic, who is supposed to stretch. Yeah, he had, he, had like a, he had like an arm that was just sort of like one little, you know, it was just sort of a... It was you know, great. They, it was they, it was a, this cheesy thing where they only did a couple of shots, and I think that the, you know the the, the the Human Torch only flames on at the very end of the movie in sort of a cheesy animated effect. Um, Full on animation. Not a. It wasn't an effect. It was animation. Yeah, it was like he a just, cartoon. It was like he a gets cartoon. flame on. He turns into a cartoon and flies around yeah, a black yeah, background. It just, I mean, it, it's it's really sad and sort of this like bad lost film. But um, I don't know. Would don't you know, recommend I, that over the other two? Uh, High budget. Well, I'd recommend it just for historical purposes as a geek to like check it out and look at it. But it really is sort of um, it, it's a victim of the development process in Hollywood and why movies suck. And I, I think movies suck for the same reason that a lot of TV sucks, which is just everything being overproduced. It's it's you know it's like why conversations on Leno are so stiff and uninteresting. It's because every everything is planned. It may as well and it is scripted. I mean, having done similar types of television, I mean, you know, you see how that process works and you go, oh, isn't it just better if we just have an actual real conversation, right. which is why this, I love podcasts. Well, I love podcasts. I do. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, we're gonna, we Wait should, a second. Are we actually doing the podcast or are we just having a conversation? Both. Because I, I'm enjoying this conversation. Yeah, it's a good conversation. I want to wrap it up so we can do another episode. But before we go, I'm going to make you very uncomfortable. What I do for a living is I produce those interviews. For late night talk shows. Do you? Yes. For, for Leno? No, I worked for Lopez, which just ended. Oh, and then man. other late night shows. Uh, so, but it's like it's like look, there's a, there's a way. It's like yeah, you definitely want to do a pre interview, get the information. But there's but there's like but spontaneity. You can't you gotta have both. spontaneity. That's acting. But you got to have both. Like for you, as a, come on as a film expert, we want to know what films you're going to talk about, where we're going to go. So, you know, it helps the host, and then the host should jump in with their own shit, and you can jump in with your own stuff. But just to have your foundation. What you do is you, you talk on the phone with the guests beforehand. You find out what stories you want to do. Then you pick up the best ones, and the host, you go over with the host, and the host kind of lead, asks questions that leads to stories. The host, yeah, the, the, what will happen is the producer, yourself, yeah. would, would basically take notes and then condense those notes and actually give them as a card to the guest, right? Is that correct? But to the host. Or, and to the host. Yeah, so but, you, but know, you're not reading out there. The, you're not the actually host. reading, but this is sort of like, this is the produced follow the conversation, follow the, the sort of general outline of this. Now, I actually, that, that um, I think is helpful for actors that aren't used to being humans. Perfect. It's great for them. It's great for them because they need kind and of... And they're really humor. funny when they do it well. Yeah, yeah. And it's great. That, that's great. But I, I, I do think that there's like, you need to have that and you need to also have the ability to throw it out the window and go with, I mean, like um, the stuff that I do, I do on Attack of the Show live TV every week with this segment called DV Tuesday. And I take notes and then I never use them. I take my own notes. Right. Um, and it's, so usually you have just, them. it's usually just to remember an actor's name or the pronunciation of something and just like, I want to get all the, the facts right. And then I toss it out the window and then I end up just having a real conversation with what's happening now and uh, with, with whatever. I guess that's why I really have enjoyed so many podcasts and just become addicted to them is I kind of feel like they're, they're um, conversation that's untethered. You know, it's not, um, it's, it's not restricted by length and it's not restricted by subject matter. <laughs> All right, so that was uh, that was really interesting. Uh, proudly resents with Adam Spiegelman. Um, again, thank you for having me uh, having me on uh, your show there, Adam. I tweeted from at Podcrash Show. You can also tweet at me at at that Chris Gore. Uh, I tweeted at my respective audiences. 
uh, to ask me some questions. So um, I'm going to respond to some of your questions. What do you think is the best and worst movie of the year so far? Ooh, gosh, I don't know. Uh, best movie, there's a lot that are on my list. I think uh, Kevin Smith's Red State, uh, one of the best. Um, Super by James Gunn, um, I think is one of the best. In terms of worst movies, I try not to see them. I mean, I try, honestly, I try uh, to avoid seeing, if, if I have to for work, I'll go see. But there isn't something I've seen where I could say that was just god-awful. And that question was from Madman Luna 123 Madison Luna. Thanks, thanks for the question. Roland Smokin, uh, Roland Smokin, just like that, no apostrophe, asks, um, am I related to Al Gore or W.C. Gore? I am told that I am distantly related to Al Gore, that the Gores are a clan that, that uh, settled in Illinois and spread out. Um, and I actually met Al Gore once at the Sundance Film Festival. This was the year before An Inconvenient Truth actually uh, screened at Sundance. And I went up to him and we both had Sundance badges on. And uh, I said to Al Gore, I said, hey, look. I, we pointed, I looked at, pointed at my badge so he saw... My, the, my badge, last name Gore, and he looked and he looked at me and just said, hey, cuz. And uh, it, it was funny. We, we had a conversation while I hurriedly tried to get a buddy of mine to take a picture with the two of us. What was cool was just hanging out talking to him is that he was a regular dude. I really feel like if he had just been himself during that campaign, he actually would have won rather than being this sort of Vulcan-like robotic automaton. Um, uh, if he'd just, just been more relaxed, he, he actually could have won that election. Well, like, this, this whole, like, embracing of nerd culture, like, he was doing it, you know, kind of, like, ahead of its time, and especially, you know, he's not... He's, he I mean, was he's ahead like, of its time. He was ahead of its time with, he, with nerdy stuff. He does his own voice on Futurama. I mean, how more nerdy can you get? Well, his daughter, actually, uh, was a writer on the show. Oh, okay. His daughter was a writer on the show. And uh, an old, old buddy, uh, uh, buddy of mine, Dan Weber, who used to work with me at film... I have so many of these weird stories. I'm like... In a way, I'm sort of uh, uh, this guy. I, I pop up and I, I just I know people in a lot of different places. But guy Dan Weber used to work with me at uh, Film Threat magazine back in the day. Uh, before Dan went on to work on uh, Futurama and other cartoon shows, um, he shared an office with Al Gore's daughter and told me that Al Gore would call her. You know, at least every other day, like, "Hello, this is Al. Is my daughter there?" And so Dan had to like. <laughs> Dan Weber had to like hand the phone over to her. It's, 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 so that's pretty funny. Um, anyways, uh, I thank you for your questions. Um, uh, appreciate it. Uh, we're, we're wrapping up the show here. I got a couple plugs. Um, first of all, I would plug something if we had an advertiser, but you can, you can advertise on this podcast. You can actually advertise on this podcast. Um, if you go to thatchrisgore.com, click on contact, uh, just uh, put podcrash in the subject line um, and you can uh, get information about advertising this podca podcast. But you know what? I'm going to be my own sponsor. I'm in the midst of a crowdfunding campaign for a stop motion animated series called Fetishville. Mm -hmm. And Fetishville is, uh, uh, will be a 30 minute stop motion animated show broken up into uh, little bits to be shown on the internet. And it's about Girls who work at a dungeon that is the world's most exclusive dungeon. And people travel from all over. VIPs, politicians, world leaders, celebrities, rock stars go there because they, they, they fulfill your fantasies with the ultimate discretion. And there's a security breach there when they find out that someone from the White House is about to come to Fetishville. It's a comedy series. I know, it sounds weird. It's a comedy series... And it's like, uh, if you sort of like the style of animation on Robot Chicken, this is a more realistic approach to that because there's a lot of sex in it. Um, you can go to fetishville.com, that's F-E-T-I-S-H-V-I-L.com, or Indiegogo, I-N-D-I-O, uh, wait, I-N-D-I-E-G-O-G-O.com slash fetishville. F -E -T Why am I spelling this out? You can look it up, fetishville, it sounds like, Farmville, but it's it's just V I L at the end. Check out my crowdfunding campaign at indiegogo.com slash fetishville. Um, uh, this is a series that uh, I'm really proud of in terms of 
you know, what we've done experimentally with the animation so far. And secondly, with the voice talent that we've lined up. Uh, Sarah Jean Underwood is doing a voice on the show. Um, February Premier of the Year 2007. Also, you may have seen her Bustus sketches on uh, Attack of the Show. Um, also, Mary Swain. Uh, she's a pinup model along with R.E.D. Um, uh, Nikki Hunter is doing a voice. There's other people I'll be talking about later, but uh, it's it's. Uh, I expect I expect you to really enjoy Fetishville. I think you're really going to like it. I'm going to start a tradition. I'm going to start a tradition right now. The way we're going to end every show is with the most cliche line. This is a line that is the most written line in every movie screenplay. It shows up in action movies, science fiction movies, in in horror movies. This is a line that's uttered in almost 90% of the movies that you see at mainstream theaters. This line is somehow uttered and we will end every show by saying this line. Are you ready? I'm ready. You're getting, I don't think you're ready, actually. Here we go. All right. Ready? Let's get out of here! Why don't you pick on someone your own size? Hey, I don't know why you're still listening. The podcast is over. Uh, but if you are still listening, you're uh, probably also the kind of person who stays until the end of a film's credits. I like to know exactly what uh, a year looks like in Roman numerals. I like to figure that stuff out. But um, if you're that kind of person, you're a lot like me. And so for that, I think you should be rewarded. Uh, so for the first 10 people to email me through my website, that's thatchrisgore.com, click on contact, put Fetishville in the subject line, I'm going to send all of you a prop um, that's uh, going to be part of this web series. I think you're really going to like it. Um, put that in the subject line. Send me your address. Um, and if you feel really ambitious, you could send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. That's S-A-S-E. And you can send that to that Chris Gore, uh, 5042 Wilshire Boulevard, PMB 1500. Los Angeles, California, 90036. Send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, and I will send you a card that uh, I use on my DVD Tuesday segment from Attack of the Show. I probably got about uh, 100 of these things lying around. Um, I, I use this card. It has notes on it. I write notes all over it. It's all scribbled upon, and I was throwing them away, and then I, I noticed that a lot of the interns kept these, and I thought, you know, I'm going to hang on to these, and I'm going to give them to you. So... First hundred people to send me self-dressed stamped envelopes will get cards that um, I've used on uh, Attack of the Show, and I hope you enjoy that. You could use it as a bookmark or something. Anyways, the podcast now is really over, and this is when I say, Later! <laughs>